Hello, welcome everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Education TAC and the Indian Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Steve Clare from UK, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Steve Clare, MBE, FMGP, ACR, is a stained glass conservator by royal appointment to Her Majesty the Queen and national advisor on stained glass to the National Trust. He trained at the Glass House in Fulham with Carl Edwards. Later, his mentor was Alfred Fisher at Chapel Studio. In 1995, he founded Holywell Glass in Wales. It's the largest studio in the UK, interested with works at many great churches, cathedrals, and historic houses. The workshop moved to magnificent premises in a medieval water mill in 2018. Recently, Hollywell Glass has carried out major projects at the cathedrals in Wales, Winchester, Exeter, Worcester, and St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. As well as conservation work, Hollywell also makes original commissions and recently completed bespoke glass tours for the private chapel of Her Majesty the Queen at Windsor. Steve's young design team has won first prize twice in the last three years and prizes for exceptional craftsmanship in the Stevens competition hosted by the work Worshipful Company of Glaciers. Steve is also the author of Stained Glass, Art, Craft, and Conservation, published by Robert Hale, 2014. The title for today's talk is Stained Glass, Materials, and Conservation. Stained Glass, through its beauty and vibrancy, has inspired us over a thousand years. Its conservation demands are usually wide skill sets, the artifacts are at once works of art and part of architectural fabric. Close collaboration with specialists from other conservation disciplines is an essential element. The speaker will give an overview of materials, their history and means of manufacture, as well as current conservation methods. Projects of all periods from the 13th to 20th centuries are illustrated from the report stage through execution to the conservation report. A personal philosophy is outlined by the speaker based on collaborative working practices, demonstrating the challenges involved in the conservation of this essentially architectural form. Before I request Mr. Steve Clare, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please type in your name, organization name, and email ID in the chat box, and also your questions. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. Welcome, Steve. Over to you now. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for taking the trouble to uh, sign up for the for the for the uh, talk. I hope that you'll find it interesting. The uh, stained glass has been a passion for me for a very long time now, um, and I hope to uh, enthuse you with it as um, as much as it enthuses me day to day, still learning things every day. Um, I'd like to firstly thank Dr. Padma Rohila for asking me to do this. Um, I was reminded that I've known Padma for a really long time. I remember early in her career, she uh, came to my house and had lunch with my wife, Lynn and I, and uh, we enjoyed a very convivial evening. She um, has gone on to forge uh, a fantastic career and obviously um, has a wide network of um, colleagues in conservation right, right across um, the world as um, exemplified by these fantastic set of ta uh, talks which will become a wonderful resource. Um, I had a look at some of them uh, on YouTube uh, last week and it's um, re really uh, fantastic already. And, by the time it's finished, it would be a wonderful uh, set of talks. I'm going to uh, give a, an overview of uh, stained glass um, and a, its methods, many of which haven't changed uh, for many hundreds of years. And this is the in interior of actually our old workshop. We've just we moved fairly recently, but uh, a medieval craftsman would would recognize a lot of the apart from the light boxes a lot of the uh, methods and materials uh, have remained unchanged with some obvious obviously some modern conservation materials 
it's all about light, obviously, and the beauty of light coming through this wonderful material. And I thought this uh, view of my colleague Helen in the workshop really brought that to life. The stained glass conservator uh, has an enormous breadth of work. Uh, it's it's uh, necessary for someone in private practice to uh, undertake all sorts of work. So that ranging, for, I'll give you an overview here, the range of this is 16th century French glass from a private collection. And you can see lots of complex edge bonding has been carried out on this and the edge bonds are being touched in on the light box. Uh, get to work on wonderful 15th century glass. This is uh, a beautiful head from Winchester by Thomas of Oxford one of the few medieval craftsmen that we actually know by name and through contracts. This is a superb uh, 16th century French panel and uh, I include this because there is of the absolutely superb palette, the color palette in this, as glass became more and more sophisticated, so did the palette. And this is uh, uh, moving into the 18th century, this is an incredible set of images of uh, work by Francis Edgington of Birmingham with several panes of glass, which you can see are painted with this sort of pantalus technique in enamel. This is another layer of it with a more smear uh, layer. And when these various, this is three pieces of glass painted on all, all six faces, and you get this astonishing three-dimensional Im image when uh, they place together within a, within a frame. And this is when glass, uh, stained glass became uh, painting on glass rather than moving a long way from the traditional technique. And this is it in situ. And also uh, we do slightly unusual things. This is, this is the clock at, at the top of Selfridge's department store uh, and uh, you can see my colleague Sarah applying resin to the clock face because uh, a scaffolder hit it with the scaffolding pole. And that uh, convex uh, clock face is made of two pieces of glass with literally millions of glass, coloured glass beads trapped in between. So you can imagine we didn't want to disturb that. So we carried, we carried out a holding repair with resin to the cracked front face. And more conventionally, we are privileged to work on great buildings. And this is a, a snap that I took with my mobile phone. And it's, uh, uh, it shows the privilege of working on superb buildings. This is from a cherry picker right up in the roof of King's College Chapel in Cain Cambridge. And I remember standing on that, uh, on that platform thinking, goodness me, someone, someone's actually paying me to do this. We look now at the materials and there are uh, several types of uh, glass that have been in usage over a very long period, over a thousand years. Um, we've got crown glass, cylinder glass and later slab glass. And crown and cylinder glass, there, there is a misconception that cylinder glass came first and then crown glass followed on. But uh, from having looked at ancient glass, uh, crown glass was actually in usage right from the earliest period alongside cylinder glass. So this is crown glass and you can see from this rather fuzzy image, uh, it's, this is from the very early 20th century and you can see that the glass blower here has blown out a, bleak, a big flute like a huge champagne flute and then the glass is uh, spun, it's actually put back into the furnace and then placed on a rest and spun and the centrifugal action forces it out into these great tables of glass. This is a fairly modest crown glass, uh, crown of glass, uh, because we know uh, from looking at the edges and um, estimating the uh, radius of the, and of the crowns that uh, in the, the 17th and 18th century, they were routinely spinning uh, crowns that were six feet across and the glass in those crowns became incredibly thin. And you can see 
uh, often under a millimeter in thickness. And you can see here that the both surfaces of the glass in the crown glass process are pristine. They're, they just spun in the, in the air, so they not, uh, don't have any impurities touching the sur surface. So the glass has a wonderful clarity. This is the cylinder process. So you have a, a, a gather of uh, molten glass here being smoothed on a metal plate, the marva. It's then blown into an elongated um, shape and then heated up again in, in the furnace and then swung. You can see that this has been swung over a pit to elongate the, uh, the cylinder. Now at this stage, it, um, the earliest glass was actually cut open while it was still molten and forced out onto a, a, a stone or a metal surface uh, to form small sheets and that's termed broad glass. It's often filled with imperfections that it picks up, but it's also, it ranges from thick and thin and it's actually rather a beautiful material. In the later method, and we can see that here, the cylinders are allowed to cool. And you can see, if you look carefully at the image, that the, uh, a diamond has been drawn along the, the glass and tapped. And the tension within the cylinder forces one edge open. And you can see the open edges on these, on these cylinders. They are then reintroduced into the uh, furnace and teased open with a metal tool and then finally ironed with a block of damp fruit wood which is rather a dramatic um, process and that's how um, uh, sheets of glass are still made today and the, the craft of making glass making the sheets of glass and our craft of cutting it up and using it, using it in stained glass windows have always been separate and they still remain separate today. This uh, illustration uh, shows the slab method where glass is blown into a rectangular mold. And you can see from the bottom right image that the glass becomes thick and thin. And this was a glass beloved of the uh, craftsman in the arts and crafts period and it possesses a fabulous fire and you can see it here uh, hold arrests the light in the most wonderful way and when it's cut up and let it into windows it's the most sumptuous material and of course people wanted to, later people wanted to make large sheets of glass and this uh, I've included some of the more modern methods here. This is called the improved cylinder method and this is where a glass is drawn out of a vat which is the base there and at the top uh, compressed air is blown into this into this cylinder and this is on a huge scale. That cylinder is about 40 feet tall so and this is then craned onto a bed and cut up into sheets so it's on a huge scale they could make massive sheets of glass from this method. And of course, there were many um, machine made glasses, textured glasses, which were used uh, in many uh, uh, vernacular windows uh, uh, through the uh, 19th and 20th century and still used today. And this is a continuous process. You can see that the molten glass is drawn through water cooled textured rollers and the sheets of glass made. So if we look at the lead now, the lead that holds the windows together, initially this was cast into wooden or metal molds uh, in, into the H section and the glass slots into either side of the H section and is then soldered and we'll look at that process a little later. Uh, but then um, later on, they developed lead mills so that the uh, H section cast uh, casts are then milled through a machine to get various different sections. And these can range from very large inch wide sections to minute uh, under uh, 16th of an inch um, fine leads for repairs. This is an interesting uh, 
uh, lead section dated 1751. And you can see here that the manufacturer has put his initials and the date that was cut into the wheel of the mill and at every revolution it impressed it into the lead. And when we find these, of course, now we um, uh, conserve them. So the lead is um, wrapped around each piece of glass um, and it's uh, normally constructed on a rubbing. So the rubbing of the original lead work is taken and you can see that the glazier has the original rubbing from the uh, from the panel before it was dismantled and it's been built across with the H section lead uh, held in place with farrier's nails, horseshoe nails, which have also been used for um, centuries and they have the benefit of having a very pointed end and a flat side so they can be tapped in to the bench to hold the glass and they don't damage the edges and they can be easily drawn out again. This is a more complex piece of leading, and this is uh, this demonstrates how the um, stained glass craftsman uh, has to uh, look at uh, the glass as he works across the rubbing. This is a an arts and crafts piece of uh, a piece of work by Christopher Wall, the doyen of the arts and crafts period, and it has hugely thick sections of glass about half an inch thick and other much thinner sections so the glazier has to move towards the thicker sections and uh, widen out the leads and then diminish again so it's quite a demanding process lots of concentration and uh, a day spent uh, leading up a panel such as this is is uh, mentally draining and just a word about how important neat lead solder joints are. You can see that the, the, each lead has been cut by a very sharp knife here and meets really nicely. Each one of these joints is then uh, wiped with a tallow candle and the tallow acts as a flux and it quite simply keeps uh, the little area that you want to solder with a hot iron um, free from oxidization so that the solder which was formed from tin and lead uh, flows nicely in that little area and if you don't have neat solder joints the lead can drop down with gravity into the gap beneath the joint it can then be prey to wind flex as the windows in the building and also when some uh, poor devil comes to dissemble the panel in the future, um, the glass is locked into the solder and you run a very high risk of breaking glass as the panels are dismantled. So it's extremely important to have neat solder joints. This is my colleague Helen doing a test assembly of some panels from uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And you can see that in these panels there are complex shapes divisions between the, the small panels of uh, stained glass which correspond to support bars and as these these lights these windows are uh, 22 feet high we didn't want to arrive on site and find that they didn't interlock together neatly so this is a, a test assembly on the bench and as we were talking about the the shaped bars there at Dublin, we'll move on to talk about the support systems because uh, leaded stained glass just wouldn't self support. It would really quickly um, sag and fall out of the window openings. So it must have a support system. And I'm beginning here by showing a remarkable uh, ferramenta, which means a set of interlinked uh, support bars and we know with some certainty that this ferramenta dates from 1306 because uh, it's a scheme of glass from Norbury in Derbyshire, uh, which um, celebrates the noble families involved in the, uh, in the uh, Welsh campaigns uh, in the early 14th century. And within the heraldry in this scheme, you have the arms of Robert Bruce. 
And of course, after 13-6, Robert Bruce was firmly off the Christmas card list because he tried to uh, usurp the throne. Um, so you have here, you can see the stained glass panel at the bottom uh, in place. And each, each panel sits on these um, lugs that jut out. So each panel is supported individually and uh, then held on the outside by rather neat wrought iron wedges. And this uh, method is still used right across Europe. In the UK, however, um, during the 19th century, we thought it would uh, uh, be better to stack one panel on top of another with a broad lead bridging the, the two. Um, and this was actually a retrograde step. It's regrettable that we did that uh, because this original lug bar system has a lot going for it. Um, it actually uh, means that individual panels can be easily accessed. They just sit on the lugs. They pointed with lime mortar at the, at the perimeter and can be easily removed. Soldered to these uh, to the stained glass panels and twisted around the support bars are lead or later copper uh, wire uh, ties which are soldered to the panel and then twisted around the bars. Conventional bars are just horizontal bars set into pockets in the stonework and you can see here a lead tie which, which um, uh, frequently tied in little rosettes like this and here a copper tie, which is twisted and, and tucked neatly against the bar. Copper is much more, much stronger than, uh, than lead ties. Looking at surface decoration, uh, you will know that stained glass is uh, painted and uh, the surface detail fired in a kiln. And there's several different types of surface decoration. This piece here, uh, which is a, a fabulous head um, from the, uh, the 16th century from the National Trust at the Vine, has all the different types of um, decoration on it. It has glass paint, which is the dark brown pigment, which is painted around the eyes and the nose here. Uh, and that fires at about uh, 650, 670 degrees. You then have silver stain, which was first developed in the 14th century, and this is the yellow. And you can see from this piece this, uh, that the, the stain is applied thickly or thinly, and by its application and kiln manipulation, colors ranging from deep amber and red right through to lemon yellow can be achieved. And you can, can imagine that the, the development of silver stain really transformed the craft uh, because you could delineate the hair as in this image um, in silver stain, whereas previously you would have needed to insert a lead. So pictorially, it was a huge step forward. And also if you look closely at the lips and the eyes, they have the third sort of decoration, which was developed in the 16th century, and that is enamel. And that is um, uh, a, a technique where colored glass is ground up and applied to the surface. So it becomes a transparent layer, and that's fired at a much lesser, uh, lower temperature. I should stay, say incidentally, I don't think I said that silver stain is actually silver nitrate, which is mixed in a paint in a clay carrier painted on the glass, normally on the reverse of the glass in the case of silver stain and painted and fired in the kiln. And that uh, fires at a lower temperature than the grisaille, the glass paint, but at a higher temperature than the enamel. These are the tools of the trade for glass painting. You can see various badger hair stipplers, um, riggers, the long haired uh, brushes for applying trace line and they are uh, normally sable and also natural sponges. And you can see at the top, uh, there are 
uh, a large number of test firings for different colored pigments, uh, different thicknesses and a note of the temperature. And we have a huge amount of these in the workshop as do all conservation, glass conservation studios. And they help us to match pigments when we're having to do uh, insertions for uh, earlier glass and they give you a prompt they move you in the right direction so that you don't have to do hundreds of test firings so this is a, a piece of 14th century glass being painted on a light box and you can see that the glass paint is being applied here this is a, a leaf uh, design an oak leaf design and you can see here on the left is an original piece of glass and on the right is a copy, a faithful copy, um, a fire, a kiln fired. At the bottom, you'll see uh, there's a date incised into the glass paint. So as well as the conservation record recording interventions, it's actually recorded on the artifact so that um, future craftsmen, art historians can uh, readily um, perceive any uh, interventions and when they were done. Um, this is an interesting case in point because uh, there is a philosophical debate about whether insertions should be painted to mimic the original glass. Um, my personal view is that we work mainly for churches and that the church is a living church. Um, it's very diff difficult for me to suggest to a parish that, uh, for example, the damaged head of Christ should be replaced with a bit of stippled glass, which it was often in the, uh, for instance, in the 1970s, they want the uh, head of Christ to read and to be um, near to the original design intent. So uh, my position is that pieces should be faithfully copied, but really carefully recorded. And in the case of this image, of course, painting the glass to closely match the cleaned um, original glass also acts as a benchmark so that if the original glass darkens, it's a telltale to, to suggest that something's amiss environmentally and we need to look at the glass again. So that was some of the reasoning behind uh, closely copying this glass at Norbury. This is an example of uh, enamel glass and you, uh, most of the, the, the detail on here is painted and enameled glass on white sheets of crown glass. So uh, no, no pot metal glass, no glass with color inherent in the body of it. Let's have a look now at some conservation and repair methods. I've included this slide because there is actually uh, an Indian uh, element to uh, its conservation. This is a 16th century uh, roundel from the Low Countries. Um, we know that uh, many of these uh, roundels were derived from engraved uh, sources and we were able to um, send out a request to our colleagues, the art historians, and to get a, an, a, an original uh, engraving for this. So we, we knew what the image was. We got the authority to cut in the new uh, sections and repaint them. And uh, this, this is the roundel put back together with new inserts. It's, it's quite successful, close to here on the on the recording from the light box, you can see all the myriad of uh, resin repairs, but in the building, you really can't see it. This was caused by a fire, the, the damage to this. Um, what was of interest is that you'll see in the background that there is a sort of muddy white enamel. And we, we struggled to uh, reproduce this enamel. Uh, but when I, uh, when we were in uh, India many years ago, uh, which is when we first met Padma, um, and our, uh, my mentor Alfred Fisher, I know who's looking, uh, who's watch watching this talk, so I'm, I'm minding my p's and q's. Um, 
he's uh, he um, arranged for some for us to have some light boxes, which you've seen uh, in use on some of the earlier images. Uh, but when we arrived, the light that we had just had light tables and the glass on top wasn't obscured. Um, and uh, indicative of the can do attitude that's prevalent in India, um, we, uh, the, uh, the uh, university said, Oh, don't worry. And they got this chap in who appeared with a large lump of pumice, natural pumice, and some water. And he set to, and uh, with some el elbow grease, frosted the glass absolutely beautifully for our purposes. Uh, but it had that very particular look. So, um, it stuck in my mind and for the little bits of uh, background here we just rubbed very thin glass with with natural pumice and it matched in really beautifully and and here you can see epoxy resin used to really good effect on this um, head from the Kemp studio damaged by uh, an air gun pellet now years gone past this would have been discarded but we were able to put the, the fragments together, held in place with dental wax on the reverse and carefully assembled. And we then um, cast resin in, into the cracks, even the, 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 deep, the deep area where the pellets had hit. And uh, you can see that this is really successful and we've, we've gained another at least 40 years uh, for this uh, glass. And even if it, if it yellows slightly, which it probably will, it's still there, the original material is still there and it can be revisited. This is a, 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 a lovely panel from the library at Winchester Cathedral, which was hit by a cricket ball. And you can see also here that uh, this has been um, put back together with an epoxy resin. We use um, Araldite 2020, which was a formerly a Sibagaigi product. Um, and it's an, uh, an epoxy resin, which we uh, measure out carefully by weight. Um, and um, it's got a very similar refractive index to glass. It's, um, it's put into the cracks with a fine point and pulls along with capillary action. Um, if necessary, we do tint it with uh, dyes, but we, we tend not to do that. We tend to just use the pure resin and touch in the, the cracks with artist acrylic. This is a recent piece of work, um, fabulous piece of work carried out by a mercurial uh, conservator, uh, Gemma Cursis, that works as part of our team. A very badly disfigured an uh, extremely important English roundel from the 15th, showing the discovery of the head of uh, St. Edmund. And this, this is the, um, the roundel put back together. Absolutely wonderful image of the highest quality, historically important because 15th century roundels are, are very rare. This is the conservation diagram uh, for the work. I'll look a bit later on at conservation records. This is the uh, copper foil method or the Tiffany method. And this was, uh, as the name suggests, developed in the USA by Tiffany for his windows. And um, it has um, a very thin copper uh, tape with, which has a, an adhesive backing which was fixed either side of, of the uh, cracked glass. It is then soldered and the, the heat pulls through and forms in effect a tiny eight section lead. These are incredibly subtle and put back into uh, the masonry surround. They do really disappear in. And another beauty of them is that they're very reversible. A, a scalpel tip can remove them um, on the unpainted reverse side of the glass uh, very readily. So it's a good conservation practice. And here is a piece of glass which uh, originally had five cracks, a star crack. And you can see that we've been able to repair 
four of them with these very fine copper foils. The fifth one, the um, uh, with the daylight showing, has, had been nibbled away or grosed by the previous repairer. So a little string lead had to go in there because it was too broad for a copper foil. Some case studies now. Um, looking at the, um, the, the superb um, Jesse tree window from Wells from 1340. Um, this is the internal scaffolding to the window and you can see that it was quite a work in itself. It was bought up, built up from the ground and then girders put across to the gallery walkways uh, at the triforium level. And then the scaffolding below taken away so that the business of the cathedral could continue. And it was quite um, unnerving the first time that you stepped out on there. Um, and even more so with large bodies of ad uh, advisory groups on there. Uh, I, I tended to keep uh, in close to the window rather than outside. This is the view from the scaffolding. Amazing view down the, uh, the um, choir and nave of the cathedral. The glass is wonderful, quintessentially English um, and has a really unusual palette. Lots of green and gold relatively small accents of blue and uh, um, ruby glass. It's been like, likened to a field of spring flowers and I think, think that's really apt. It really is a very special window and astonishingly it escaped the wholesale um, iconoclasm that affected the rest of the cathedral because of its lofty position anecdotally someone did get up to break the glass and and fell uh, from from the balcony so they thought better of it uh, you can see that um, uh, the glass painting is really magnificent this is the virgin lactate uh, from the center light um, and here you can see a close-up of the head of christ and you can see a new piece of glass being painted in uh, for the face of Christ. And this was more or less the only uh, intervention of new glass, a policy of um, ultra conservative approach was uh, adopted for the window. It wasn't re-leaded and barely any insertions of new glass were included. It was just cleaned within the lead and then installed with protective glazing. The exception was made for the head of Christ and we'll, we'll move on and look at this superb image here of the completed work. You can see um, immense pathos of this Christ figure. It's one of the major works of 14th century art in England. It has grapes around it which are red as you can see. All the rest of the grapes on the vine of the Jesse tree are white. Uh, red around the figure of Christ, Christ as a mark of the passion. Uh, and of course, a, a crucifixion within a Jesse window is rather unusual. They are founded largely on a Marian cult. Uh, so it's unusual to have uh, this superb figure of Christ in a, a Jesse window. And this is, uh, we'll look incidentally in more detail at the protective glazing for the Wells Jesse a little later. This is a 19th century window by Hardman and Co, a huge window at Worcester Cathedral, the West Window. And you can see that it is split up into many panels of individual panels, but they are large uh, panels. The work was carried out in three phases and these are marked on this illustration. And the work was necessary because there was wholesale buckling of the lead work. So this window was re-leaded, a huge undertaking. It leaked really, really severely uh, in heavy weather. Uh, in fact, when I surveyed it, it was uh, in heavy weather. It was more or less like standing on a shower, in a shower inside the building. So there was no doubt about the need for intervention. And you can see that the lead work is very complex. This is the uh, one of the sub 
support bars in there and you can see that the ties were also not properly done up so the whole structure wasn't well complete uh, supported and here's some more detail of cracks and bowing of the lead work and the cement uh, which waterproofs the window which is a mixture of linseed oil and chalk and uh, lamp black with some red lead oxide uh, put in there as a dryer forced into under the cames of the lead to waterproof it. Um, you can see that it's become friable here and is falling out. Again, detail of the complexity of the lead work. It really is rather a fantastic window, one of certainly one of Hardman's best. And that uh, 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 my son Jack just taking out the first panel. So you can see you get some uh, idea of the scale each one of the panels is nearly as tall as a nearly as tall as a man and they are extremely heavy so lots of very heavy physical manual labor lifting these down the scaffolding and this is a panel relayed on the light box and uh, pa uh, photographs taken in uh, surface light too so that there's a good record of the painted detail Lots of the glass was cleaned, as I said, within the lead. And this is a dissembled panel on a rubbing. So for this uh, a panel a window such as this, where complex re-leading is undertaken, three rubbings are taken. One to lay out glass, as here. Uh, one uh, to re-lead and one to mark up as the conservation record. And here are some... Uh, paint tests for Worcester, as we've already said, and some painted inserts going on uh, on the uh, on the light box. You can see that uh, this is well pre-COVID-19, and you can see that uh, Shane here is wearing a mask because uh, stained glass paint has lots of uh, unpleasant materials, uh, such as uh, heavy metals in it, so you have to take great care. Here are some of the zigzag borders which are being copied. And a, a complex resin bond for one of the cracked heads. One of the problems, particular problems at Worcester was loss of painted detail, fairly common in the Hardman glass. And um, we adopted a policy of uh, producing painted backing glasses um, Actually, in, in effect here, we, no, we normally put these on the back, but we found at Worcester that they read better from the inside. So these painted uh, gla um, support glasses uh, supporting the painted detail are actually applied on the front inside the building and they serve to uh, reinforce painted detail in key areas. So you can see the the sorrowing uh, Mary on the left, that's the support, that's the support for her, and that's the completed panel. And some complex resin repairs again to key areas. And this is work commencing on the complex rubbing for on the re-leading. And these are panels in uh, near and completion on the same rubbing. And uh, entire lights here laid out on the light box so that one panel is built on another so that they run on nicely. Here's Dora here working on one of the uh, beginning work on one of the central roundels. Some interesting previous um, uh, recording here which uh, uh, marks a repair from the uh, early 20th century. Moving on to look at site fixing, you can see that uh, panels of stained glass are actually fitted into grooves in the stonework. You can see the, this head of a panel being inserted into the groove. The perimeters of the uh, stained glass windows tied securely to the support bars, which you've already discussed, are then pointed at the perimeters with lime mortar. Um, and for many years lime went out of usage in the UK and routinely people pointed around the perimeters of stained glass windows with very hard cement based mortars 
and that makes uh, removal of them extremely traumatic for the glass and the stonework. So we use uh, uh, NHL, naturally hydraulic limes, uh, 3.5 because it's a slightly harder mix than for the mortar mix for, for masonry because it's a relatively small amount of mortar and it's got a job to do. If you use a very soft lime mortar around the perimeters of uh, windows, because there's a, such a small amount of it, in heavy weather, uh, moisture can drive through. So this is parged into the, to the glazing groove rather roughly at first. It's then allowed to cure for a number of hours and then pressed back. This is the mortar being compressed and it's, it's tended carefully. It's kept moist uh, with in warm weather, um, hessian is draped over it to keep it moist. And when we consider that it's cured off nicely, it's scraped with a tool to bring out the, um, the lime and the aggregate to the surface and um, um, you can you get to uh, that's still got a little bit of drying to do, but you can see that the uh, mortar matches in really nicely with the uh, original ashlar. Environmental protective glazing um, has been developed right across Europe um, since the 19th century. Um, it was noticed in predominantly in churches in Germany that um, where panels had been protected with external glazing which was just put there to keep the weather out medieval glass had survived very much better than uh, when glass was unprotected and this of course sparked the curiosity of stained glass conservators and conservation scientists. And it was soon realized that the predominant em enemy of ancient glass is actually cycles of condensation. And what the protective glazing served to do was to, for the external layer to take the brunt of the protective glazing and for the ancient glass to stay mainly dry. Uh, it was rather a blunt instrument at first, but when the conservation scientists became involved and it was properly evaluated, it was, it's become a, f uh, a carefully formulated process so that the gap between the glass and the importance of airflow and the, uh, has been realized. So now we've arrived at the situation where we uh, encourage the air from the inside of the building to flow between the ancient glass and the new exterior glazing with some air movement. Um, and we found through complex environmental monitoring and we have some really top notch uh, conservation scientists in the UK who look at this. We, we habitually work with a uh, conservation scientist in uh, Cambridge, a chap called Tobit Curtis who's recently produced a comprehensive working paper for Heritage England on, on protective glazing, um, which really finally pins down all the finer points of what's necessary for the conservator to get the very best outcome. This image on which we've dwelt for a while shows the protective glazing at wells. And you can see that on the, the ancient glass, there are very fine vertical bars which follow the lead lines and they are, the bronze bars are fixed to the panels and the reason for that was that because we elected not to re-lead we wanted to give them a bit of extra support and on the outside you've got these hinged bronze um, frames which form the external glazing. You'll see that the external glazing at wells remarkably remarkably is glazed in diamond quarries and although we trialed a whole um, host of different treatments for the protective glazing um, uh, we weren't happy with any of them and the and the statutory bodies which came in groups to look at them weren't happy either and the then architect uh, at the cathedral peter bird 
who was a man that understood the building in its landscape acutely well, said to me one day, listen, let's look at the building from a distance. So we walked to a viewpoint. It's not easy to see the window uh, from street level. And he pointed out to me that all the surrounding windows in the chapter house and the large window above were glazed in diamond quarries. And he said, well, let's trial diamond quarries. It will unite the facade and it will be relatively cheap and easy to maintain for future generations. And of course, I thought this is never going to work. You'll see the diamonds through the glazing. Well, we trialed it and in fact, you can't see it at all. Even in raking light on a winter's morning, you can't see the diamonds. So that, that proves that the, protect, the treatment of the external glazing has to be taken on a case by case basis. Normally the treatment um, leads up the external glazing in a leaded light um, that follows the primary lead lines and that's more conventional. Or if um, the window can't be seen easily, and I'm thinking here of the, the great east window at Exeter, which can't be seen externally at all from the street level, uh, then a planar treatment with big sheets of glass can be treated. It's on a case by case basis. Here you can see the bronze hinges, which were custom made for wells. And in the traceries at Wells and elsewhere, I listened to younger colleagues. And uh, I was making these frames in a, um, the conventional way, just bending the metal, which is extremely difficult and time consuming. And younger colleagues said, well, why don't you take a template, have it uh, 3D scanned and have these frames water jet cut, which um, we did. And it was a, a revelation for me. So you can see here that the, uh, we're taking uh, careful wood templates from the openings. And here are the, uh, the Wells traceries. And they uh, water jet cut from bronze. They fitted these masonry with pinpoint perfection. Um, and we then moved on it. This is at Exeter Cathedral, medieval glass in the clear story. If we go back to the Wells one, you can see that the glass is applied behind the frame and the frames rather large. At Exeter, we refi refined it. We made smaller frames and the perimeter lead, the eight section lead of the tracery sits over the bronze frame. So the whole thing becomes thinner and yet more discreet. And you really cannot see this from the street level. And we've de developed various ways of framing the rectangular panels from the main lights in bronze. And this is some of the uh, uh, works in progress. Uh, and you can also um, use partial protective glazing. Uh, you can see here a 17th century panel uh, treated with protective glazing in isolation. And here the uh, wonderful medieval church at Blytheborough with medieval fragments uh, treated uh, with partial protective glazing. This is the frames in place in front of the quarry glazing. And uh, this is the medieval panels going in. And at Coteal for the National Trust, medieval panels put on complex bronze frames and here set in place in front of the glass again. Collaboration, essential in stained glasses as in any other conservation discipline. This is the fabulous um, scheme in the Presbytery Clear Story at Winchester. Some of my team here and a celebration at the end of the project, uh, which went on for five years. Other works were carried out there, including these sensational roof bosses uh, carried out by McNeilich Conservation. The stained glass at Winchester is recognised as some of the finest painted glass in England, again by uh, Thomas Glazier and we think his son John Glazier. These are some of the wonderful heads. We found, however, that um, some of these wonderful lions in the shafts of the, of the uh, window 
had deteriorated to a shocking degree in some of the uh, panels on the south side. And we found that uh, the, uh, they were coated with uh, some sort of layer. We looked in the archive and we found that in the 19th century, the, the cathedral had a painting by Benjamin West directly beneath these windows, which it held in great esteem and it didn't like the light falling on the painting. So they took the, uh, the step, an extraordinary step by modern uh, uh, considerations of painting over the medieval stained glass with a diffusing layer. We then uh, had this layer analyzed. It was found to be a lime wash and we wondered, well, why has a lime wash had such a profound effect? This uh, led us to look at other projects. This is the lovely Christopher Wall glass at Gloucester. We noticed at Gloucester that some of the tie bars had rusted to an astonishing degree. And again, a puzzle. But the, the architect at, uh, ex, at um, Gloucester, Anthony Feltham King, had noticed a hole in the wall very near to this acute damage, which he thought was um, a vent for an historic heating system. We also noticed that there was particular panels of damage to the great west window at St George's Chapel at Windsor. You can see the figure on the left. There's a band of paint loss, which is much less than the panel to the right. So we, here we had a lucky accident and we found, um, I chatted about this to Tony Jeans, who was the, at the time, the archivist at uh, Gloucester. And he said, we've got a document about the previous heating regimes. And it turned out to be an extraordinary document. It was a round robin letter sent out from the, the architect at, um, at uh, Gloucester, who was already suspecting that the heating was really affecting the stained glass and the uh, fabric, wider fabric in the, in the stonework at the cathedral. And he got back, uh, he asked all of the great cathedrals and buildings in, in the UK, what, what stoves are they using? And it turns out that they were all using coke fired stoves. Um, huge coke fired stoves um, and it turned out that a, a company called the London Warming and Ventilation Company were very successful in, in selling these stoves which were to a patent by uh, Sir Goldsworth Gurney, the Gurney stove. Um, he, they sold these stoves which consumed two tons of coke each a week and they tended to use poor quality coke uh, to most of the buildings and cathedrals in England and it's also recorded that the flues to these uh, stoves began to leak not long after they were installed so we had a century of um, acidic condensation billowing into the um, into the cathedrals and the architect um, at Gloucester's uh, remarked that there was uh, a, a, a completely uh, um, a, 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 an air of brimstone, the smell of brimstone within the cathedral, which was obviously not a good thing. We then found um, we then passed this back to the conservation scientists and they outlined a, um, a process whereby the acidic condensation reacted with um, the lime layer on the lime wash layer on the stained glass and um, produced uh, the deterioration that was evident in the painted glass. So we, we then understood the process documentation you can we're going to stay with Winchester looking at the lovely se uh, series of windows um, uh, instigated by Bishop Fox at the very start of the 16th century.
figures of female saints in the traceries, the larger figures in the main lights lost to the iconoclast, but these rather lovely things, and aren't they exquisite, they survived. So we developed, um, find a, a method which we've been working on for, for years at, um, at Holywell Glass of it superimposing the image, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an image of from the light box onto the stonework so we know exactly where each panel is. This uses the ubiquitous CVA, CVMA labeling system. So this is the actual um, light box images of the figures. And then this is the post conservation diagram so that you can see we then superimpose the diagram onto its um, respective opening in the stonework. And you can of course zoom in on and interrogate each one of the diagrams. The, uh, the, we then provide a key, obviously, to, to the, uh, but we've kept this, we've honed this down so it's as simple as possible, because records with stained glass in particular are a real problem. They are routinely handed over to small parishes, uh, paper records languish in uh, damp vestries and are lost. Uh, so this digital, we hope that this really honed down um, digital system will really carry forward and, and assist uh, conservative in the future. For larger projects, of course, we produce um, paper um, record. And this is um, one of the volumes we produce for Windsor entirely on acid free. Uh, all the materials are acid free and uh, principles of conservation laid out at the start. Um, and then a panel by panel photographic record and a record of um, each one. Um, a plug as we near the end for uh, a, a talk on the 27th of November, which I'm doing for the British Society of Master Glass Painters. The um, uh, website to um, join that is um, uh, at the top, 27th of November. And this is uh, the, the book that I produced some years ago. This was aimed primarily at the younger professional coming into stained glass, but it's got lots of useful base material for custodians of buildings in it too. Okay, that's all that I've got to say. Thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll hand back over to Padma. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. For me, it was a trip down memory lane, I think all the stained glass. <laughs> so we do have a few questions. So with your permission, I'll take a Yes, happy to answer some question questions. question is from Nick Boyce and he's asking you that, have you got a mentee to whom you would be transferring this knowledge, this, uh, this vast knowledge that you have? Uh, do you have a mentee to whom this knowledge is now getting transferred? That's the question. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, uh, uh, my, my company is continuing. Um, we've got a, a, a team here based on youth and my son Jack is carrying the, carrying the firm forward and we also have a fantastic team here. Uh, our studio manager, uh, Sarah Knighton, has recent, uh, become accredited in recent years, and she's a she's a great student. So, uh, yeah, a whole team, and certainly uh, uh, some individuals that show yet fantastic promise for uh, for carrying the work forward. Thank you. The next question is. Which materials and procedures are used to clean the glass? Uh, which consultants are you using for glass? And what are the best resins to be used to fill lacunas in order to keep the transparency intact? Um, well, we, 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 we favor um, the, the, the Araldite 2020 resin because we simply find that it's more predictable uh, there's another excellent product called product called Hextel, which um, is commonly used, uh, but we've found that far more 
um, uh, delicate in terms of fluctuations in temperature. So we 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 favour uh, the uh, Araldite twenty twenty consolidants. Um, I've got I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about consolidants because um, it's introducing um, acrylic resin onto the surface, and even if that is in uh, really slight concentrations. Um, you are impregnating what is uh, already a vulnerable layer with uh, a material that will degrade. So you run the risk at some point of losing all of it. And I appreciate if something is really about to be lost that you, you probably must act. But we tend to steer firmly away from consolidation and we favor trying to control the environment through protective glazing or looking at the environment, the heating ventilation regimes within a building to try and control and uh, hang on to um, detail. What was the other point, sorry? Uh, materials and procedures used for cleaning the glass. Oh yeah, um, well we, um, you work through for cleaning, we tend to work through basically um, a hierarchy of treatments in the, um, and if something is really delicate, we'll quite often do nothing more and brush it with a, a, a sable mop and just um, hoover away debris or you could do nothing you might consider that cleaning is just too dangerous so you um, make a case with the client not to clean and then um, dry methods we use smoke sponges um, and um, bristle brushes where appropriate uh, wet cleaning we tend to just um, use deionized water or, or um, uh, sometimes if you've got soot layers that uh, you uh, are a bit more stubborn, we, we use al alcohol deionized water, generally 50-50 solution. Um, we don't use any other methods such as um, um, ultrasonic cleaning. We tend to really limit scalpel cleaning. So I think we've become more and more understated with cleaning. And uh, hand on heart, I look at past projects from 30 years ago and think I really would not have cleaned that glass so much. Okay, thank you. Next question is, if you could uh, explain a little bit more about the copper tape and uh, we'll take that up first. So that wasn't very clear, the copper tape that you use. Um, yeah, it's... Um, we just buy this in from from stained glass suppliers. It's um, it's got a 3M adhesive on the back of it, um, which um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure vaporizes away as you as you apply heat. Uh, uh, it's it's put on, it's it's applied to either side of the crack. Um, if you've got painted detail, you apply it very carefully. Um, to the painted side that you so that you don't need to cut that back and on the back you can pair it back with a scalpel to get a very slight profile i know that some conservators are are nervous even of that and they will um, make up a, a copper foil repair on uh, another piece of glass uh, and then introduce it to the so you you're actually manufacturing a minute lead in effect and and introduce that to the mm. join. I tend to think that um, uh, if you are uh, going going to, if you're worrying that much about it, you can, we've got a little lead hand lead mill and we manufacture really minute uh, age section repair leads and uh, really, really they, they're just as effective in minimizing the effect of a black line and then you solder with an electric soldering iron, draw the solder along. It's an extremely quick process. So not uh, barely any heat transferred to the glass uh, in, in the process. Thank you. The next question is, how do you treat actively corroding lead? Uh, lead? Yeah, lead game. Uh, um, it's corroding uh, lead game. Would you treat it? Um, Would you replace it? And if you do treat it, what, what are the options? Uh, we, we, we don't, uh, again, it's going, going around in a circle a bit. We, we tend to, uh, if, if it's not fulfilling its purpose and the structurally it's, uh, the, uh, the window is compromised, 
um, you can you can redo solder joints and achieve a great deal in in um, uh, re re uh, re reforming the structure of a panel. Uh, but um, if it's if it really is um, failing and and powdering away, which it sometimes does, we quite often think it's because people re-smelted old lead and uh, made their own lead, and because some lead's markedly poorer. Um, we will introduce, we'll re-lead then to make sure that the uh, longevity is there. And also, of course, if, if there's an in-between uh, circumstance, again, have a really good look at the environment of the building to see that if you can uh, stop the, the, the lead and the glass getting wet or, or, or um, cycles of condensation sitting on them. Thank you. The next question is, can biological damage change the color or the chemical nature of stained glass? Or are there any instances of biological damage, uh, you know, changing the color or the very chemical nature of stained glass? Is that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the base ingredients from the manufacturer have a, a profound effect on, on, uh, on color. Uh, notably manganese and iron, which are introduced um, on purpose in some cases to make certain hues of purple and brown and flesh tones, um, but often introduced accidentally th through the river sand is the constituent of the glass. Um, and that can really uh, darken over time. And there's precious little that can be done about that. Um, and also UV acts on some glass, particularly the lighter glass, you can see that um, glass has become purple. And when you look at the area of glass that's been beneath the lead protected, that remains uh, the, the original color. Um, and of course you can have um, uh, algae um, sitting on, on the surface and getting into the body of the glass causing Corro uh, corrosion with um, exacerbates the the action of cycles of condensation by holding the uh, moisture against the surface and some lichens as well we know that some lichen lichens secrete uh, have acidic secretions which again uh, can complicate um, it comes round again to uh, caref careful cleaning and trying trying to arrive at a, a neutral position on the surface of the glass. And, and I keep coming back to it, looking closely at the environment, uh, collaborating closely with conservation scientists to better understand that because I, I frankly don't understand enough of, about that. So I, I look to others for advice. Thank you question is, is isothermal glazing advisable for lead glass or would it cause any further issues? Um, it's, 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 I'm taking that to mean probably plain glazing. Is that what, um, what you take it to mean? Isothermal glazing. Arshada, can you hear me? Isothermal glazing, if you could just elaborate what you mean by it. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, is uh, it? Hi. Uh, basically, isothermal glazing as in uh, to uh, you know keep the glass stained glass safe from heat and other environmental uh, damage. Yeah, what does so it that, uh, Yes. So it uh, when it is leaded leaded glass, if it Ashita, is leaded, yeah. Ashita, what does yeah. it involve? What sort of glass is involved in isothermal glazing? Stained glass. I'm I'm just asking a general question. Okay. If the stained glass has lead, and we are using this uh, isothermal glazing. Will it cause any further damage, or is it okay to use on it? Yeah, it's 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 routinely used for leaded glass. In fact, majority of the glass that it's employed for is leaded. Mm. Um, it's got ben it's got benefits for the glass and and, and the lead. Um, yeah, so I I think it's um, I think you need a you need com you need common sense. I mean it's it's a it's a tool in our in our arsenal of possible approaches but it's it's uh, an architectural intervention uh, the glass is often moved from its original architectural position context 
So it has to be the aesthetics of it have to be very carefully measured. Thank you. The last question, my lord, is: Is it easy to find original drawings or diagrams of British stained glass from the 1860s? From the 1860s. Yeah. Um, uh, it, well, it's a very mixed picture because um, mm -hmm. so, some some archives uh, survive and you you stand a chance, but. Um, Many of them were discarded or, or lost in the war. Uh, so uh, generally, it, it isn't it isn't too easy to find original drawings, but they they do they do exist and they're in various archives. And there are some uh, really notable scholars of nineteenth um, century glass. Um, prominent among them, Peter Cormack. Uh, and um, Martin Harrison, uh, amongst others, um, who um, who will know the likelihood of uh, availability of designs by different uh, design houses from the um, from the from the eighteen sixties. Not altogether easy, though, in a very mixed yeah. bag. But you can you can get advice about the likelihood of them being extant. I have a question. This is, yes. if you have a glass which is repaired to a large extent, would you recommend a plain glass at the back as an additional protective backing or is it something that should be avoided? Because we don't do stained uh, glass, but we do get, you know, painted glass uh, from the back. And sometimes even after the repair, there's always this danger of, you know, the, the piece being weak with the addition. So is it advisable to give a plain glass at the back. Yes, yes. Oh, off, often it's sensible because, yeah, a, a, a piece that's been really comprehensively damaged is, is inherently weaker. You want to protect it from, if it's going back into an architectural setting, you want to protect, protect it from the weather and wind flex, extremes of temperature. So, yeah, I, I, we would use uh, glasses on the reverse. Uh, if it's getting protective glazing or it's in a museum setting, yeah. it's probably not necessary. Okay. I think those are the questions. Thank you so much for your time and your patience, Steve. It's so a great pleasure and thank you everyone for taking the time to listen. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye.